Thank you, David. So in 2010, a revolution was underway in UK government. Visionaries like Lord Maud, who we heard from yesterday, were really set about to reimagine the way that we design and deliver public policy. Now, one of the products of this revolution was the government digital service. And another product was a quirky little team called the Behavioural Insights Team. And their mission was essentially this. What would policy look like if we designed it with real people in mind? The Nudge Unit is obsessed with social impact and obsessed with answering questions that really matter. And here is a question that's been bugging me for the last two years. Here are two stark facts for you. As recently as 2014, there were two times as many FTSE 100 bosses called John as there were women. Or closer to home, and as we recently just heard, 94% of the workforce of four of Silicon Valley's largest tech companies is white. Now, the personal and the social costs of this level of labor market imbalance is really clear. In fact, some of you may well have experienced it yourselves. But what's becoming even more clear is that there's huge commercial costs associated with this lack of diversity. Work by organizations like McKinsey have shown that diverse leadership teams are significantly more likely to outperform their industry mediums. We've got studies that have shown that diverse teams are more creative, they're more innovative, they produce more influential research. We've even got research that shows that more diverse juries consider information more closely, and they're more likely to res result in more accurate assessments. So to me, this looks like a bit of a conundrum. The case for diversity is blindingly clear, and yet what we see in the cutthroat world of the labor market just falls so woefully short. So that's when I started to spend some time thinking about what's the decision-making environment for when people make hiring decisions. And that's when I discovered this other scary fact. Six seconds. Six seconds is the approximate length of time someone's going to spend looking at your resume when you send it in for a job. Now, if they're spending just six seconds on your resume, it's kind of important to think about what it is that they're paying attention to. Because it's not like recruiters don't care. In fact, it's not like they're not actually looking for the best person for the job. It's just that when you think about the fact that there are over 60 million jobs on offer in the US alone every year, and for the, every time one person gets a job, there's hundreds or sometimes thousands of people who've applied for it, there's just a lot of really, really fast thinking going on. So this is what research tells us they're paying attention to. They get stuck on the things at the top. Now, for those of you who think, well, hey, in the US, we don't put our age on our resumes, I'd like you to think about the last time you looked at someone's resume, and can you honestly tell me you didn't look at when they finished school or when they finished university and tried to figure out how old they might actually be? Now, the reason why we know that people get stuck on these things is economists have been running studies for the last 20 to 30 years with a very simple design. They take a CV and they put a number on it, and they send it out to thousands of real employers, and they wait to see who gives them a call for an interview. But before they send those out, they change one small thing. Now, in most of these studies, they change the name at the top of that CV. Or to be more precise, they change the ethnic association of that name. And this is what they found. What I'm showing you here are data on the percentage of additional CVs that a person with a non-white sounding surname needs to send to receive the same rate of callback for interview. Now, bear in mind that's with precisely the same CV, same experience. 40 to 75% more CVs. So organizations have become aware of this problem, aware that they're attending to all kinds of pieces of information which don't help them decide who's ultimately going to be best for the job. And they've started doing this, blinding themselves. And that's, in fact, what we started to do in the Behavioral Insights team two years ago, when we wanted to apply best practice behavioral science to the way that we hire. Eight hours later, to a manual process of taking off names on CVs, and we started to discover that while it was definitely the right thing to do, it was just in no way the easy thing to do. And at the time, there was no tech out there to help us do what we wanted to do with our hiring process. So we hacked it. 
we created Applied, which is our first digital venture, to help us use behavioral science in the way that we hire. And we started with blinding, but then, you know, as these things go, we thought, hey, we've got technology in front of us. We could pack all kinds of insights into it. We started thinking about all the other biases that get in the way of making accurate assessments of candidates. Things like our tendency to want to hire in our own image, or the struggles that we have cognitively when we compare very dissimilar options, and the reasons why we then are more likely to take the safe or the easy choice, the man in finance or the woman in nursing. We also started thinking about the way that people read information in, in recruitment processes and the effect of halos, or something sits at the top and it creates a positive or a negative association which permeates everything you read thereafter. So we completely reshaped the selection process. And we created Applied to make the best practice recruitment smart, fair, and easy. Now, I know that I'm in a room full of people who appreciate data, like I do. So I'm pleased to share with you that earlier this year, we ran a massive parallel experiment, pitting Applied against traditional CV sifting. The headline of that was that we ultimately hired 60% of people who would never have been found if we'd been using CVs alone. Now, this group of people were also more diverse across a bunch of dimensions. One thing we discovered was that the scores that we'd given these people CVs bore no relationship to how well they performed in later rounds of recruitment, none whatsoever. Now, we've just started this journey, and we've started working with new partners to help them make their recruitment smart, fair, and easy. But I think that the ultimate lesson we can take from all of this is that with just a little bit of work, a little bit of science can go a really long way to improving social mobility. Thank you. <laughs>